Over the last few months, we have been discussing what it is that we do here when we come together to worship. And really, just how important it is for us to come together to worship. Uh, especially after the last couple of years, uh, when that has been more difficult for us to actually be here in person and have these opportunities, uh, is a really good thing for us to focus on being here face to face with each other, enjoying the fellowship that we share together. The fellowship as we uh, engage in, in the prayers that we pray together, as we talked about last month, that the prayers should be personal, they, they should be encouraging, uh, that they are incredibly important. Or as we talked about a couple months ago, and we spent our time talking about singing together collectively and uh, bringing our voices together to teach each other, to admonish one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, making melody in our hearts to the Lord. That the songs aren't just to sound good, but they are meant to encourage, to edify, to do various teaching and to admonish when necessary. We do these things as we collectively come together, and it's been a joy to, to pray together, to sing together, to partake uh, of the Lord's Supper as we did together, and now as we open up the Word of God together to spend some time in the Word of God, we're going to do so talking about how important it is, as we began last week, how important it is that we open up the Word of God when we are collectively here together, the public reading of Scripture, as John read for us just a few moments ago, and the importance of the teaching that takes place as we worship together. That's our focus for the month, uh, introduced last week as we focused had an entire service on the public reading of scripture and then this morning we will engage in various sermons that we will begin talking about the importance of teaching and this aspect of our collective work as we look at what paul talks about when he says the work of an evangelist good morning, good morning. it's good to be here this morning isn't it good to have this opportunity to, to sing together, to pray together, to take the Lord's Supper together, to open up the Word of God together. It's good to be together. And I really appreciate the opportunity that you have provided for me this morning to open up the Word of God with you. Uh, we know that we have those who are visiting with us, and we are really appreciated that, that you are here. Uh, we appreciate the fact that you could have gone to a whole lot of places this morning but you chose to join us, and that makes us feel pretty special. We're glad you're here, and uh, we hope that you will be encouraged by the time that you spend with us this morning as we look at the Word of God and see what Paul has to tell us, to teach us about the teaching and the work of an evangelist. Now, first off, as we are going to be focusing, as was read in 2 Timothy chapter 4, I just want to first, um, I guess, say that universally it seems as if 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, these are seen as uh, letters that an older preacher is giving a younger preacher to kind of help him as he's starting off preaching or, you know, some, some insight and some help. And I don't think that's at all what's actually happening with these letters. Uh, I don't think this is just advice from an old preacher to a young preacher. I think these are people that Paul very specifically put into a certain situation to handle that situation in a very certain way because he couldn't. He was doing something else. And so he put them to do that and said, here's how I would handle this situation if I were there. And so, therefore, this is how uh, I would like for you to handle this on my behalf. I think that's more likely what's taking place. Having said that, what I'm going to do today is going to sound a lot like an older preacher who's giving advice to a younger preacher. <laughs> because that's the aspect that we're going to be focusing on, it is when Paul tells Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. Well, what does that work of an evangelist look like? 
What is it that Paul wants him to do as he does this work of an evangelist? Well, unfortunately, this is going to require spending a lot of time in the dictionary and uh, looking up some words. You know, I'm not necessarily a big word study guy, but we're going to do a lot of word study type stuff this morning, so bear with me. You know, before the eyes you know, start glazing over, as the case might be, we do need to work on some definitions. And uh, the word evangelist, it carries a whole lot of baggage with it. A lot of people, when you use that term, they think various things. You know, you go to um, just uh, looking at good old Webster or the like, you know, some very various definitions you'll find. Maybe an evangelist is a Protestant minister or layperson who serves as itinerant or special preacher, especially perhaps a revivalist. Now this is the way that a lot of people think of what an evangelist is given a certain context in history. This probably doesn't have a whole lot to do with the way that Paul is talking about an evangelist to Timothy back in the first century. So maybe an evangelist is simply a preacher of the gospel, another definition, option, or in the primitive church, and by the primitive church, what they mean is the very earliest days of the church. This would be someone, a person, who first brought the gospel to a city or a region. And that's the work that Paul is really engaged in. As you see Paul go into various areas, and he brings the gospel to these places. Now, that's probably, to some degree, what's going on uh, as Paul writes this, tells him to do the work of an evangelist, but you also remember that Timothy is in Ephesus. Ephesus is a place where there was a church in place even before Paul spent his, you know, probably two to three years in Ephesus on his third journey. The church was already there. Paul did not even establish the church that is in Ephesus. And so him going into the city to create new churches, that's probably not what Timothy is doing when Paul writes and tells him while he's there in Ephesus among these places, do the work of an evangelist. So maybe this isn't as helpful to simply look at the English, although I think a preacher of the gospel kind of helps. Therefore, um, we're going to look maybe at, and again, I'm just going to throw up some Greek for you, just so you can see the way that the words look. But looking at kind of the, the Greek definitions uh, from the standard uh, Greek lexicon, or the Greek dictionary, which is uh, just badag, is what everybody calls it. Evangelion, evangelion, is the Greek word, which is simply means good news. That's all the word gospel means. It's just good news. It's like, hey, you know, I've got some good news for you. I've got a gospel for you. And that's all that it really meant. Now, Christianity took the word and they said, is there better news than Jesus Christ? Of course not. And so they said, this is the good news of all good news. And it became a Christian word at that point. But it's not inherently a Christian word. Therefore, an evangelist is the Greek word for evangelist there. Can you see how much the word evangelist looks like the word evangelion, which is good news? Therefore, an evangelist uh, is simply someone who preaches the good news, someone who proclaims the good news, just like any number of things in our English language. You know, what is a baker? It's someone who makes baked goods, right? You know, you have that bake that works through both. We base words off of what it is that someone's doing. So all of this to say, this is an evangel evangelist, is simply one who is proclaiming the good news. And this could be anybody who is proclaiming a good announcement, but once again, Christianity took this term and said, what better news is there than the message of Jesus Christ, the Messiah who's come? 
And so when Christians began using this term, I think Paul uses this in 2 Timothy, speaking of someone who pronounces not just any news that's good, but the good news about Jesus and the good news of the hope that Jesus brings. That's why when you look in, at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and Paul talks about the gospel that he proclaimed, he says, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which you received, in which you stand, by which you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless, of course, you believed in vain, but I delivered to you. And this is now the substance, you know, in a very simplified way, this is now the substance of that gospel. I delivered to you as a first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve, and then he keeps on giving a list of people that Jesus appeared to. This is obviously not everything involved in the gospel itself, but this is a very quick, just brief synopsis that Paul gives right here. And it's very specific to Jesus. The good news concerning the Christ that he'd come, that he had died for our sins, that he was buried, and he was raised and appeared to many people. And then following this, Paul's going to talk about then the hope of life again after death. The hope of resurrection for all those who were saints there in, in Corinth and for everyone else besides those in Corinth who are God's people. This is good news. So an evangelist is one who proclaims that, that, that very good news concerning Jesus. And in the most basic sense, that's what evangelism is. I mean, we understand that, right? You saw that word evangelism and evangelion. That's, that's what it is. We're simply telling other people the good news of Jesus. We take the gospel to ears that have not heard so that they can come face to face with the risen Savior. So when I do the work of evangelists, and, and that, this is often what I mean when I introduce myself as an evangelist or, or as my job description being an evangelist, so coming back to 2 Timothy then, chapter 4, Paul seems to indicate, though, from here, that there's a little bit more involved than simply the one who proclaims the message of Jesus Christ. Because when he says, do the work of an evangelist, that follows a whole list of things that are really important in doing that work. So let's take some time to look at, at what it means to do the work of an evangelist. The first thing I want to point out is that an evangelist preaches the word. This one's the easy one, I think. Everyone associates the evangelist as someone who opens up the word of God and proclaims what's there. Now remember, for Paul, when he says preach the word, he didn't have this. when He, he was obviously still writing this, right? When he wrote these words. Uh, and so this wasn't completed. The New Testament wasn't completed at the time. So when he talks about the word, he's talking about the pages of that Old Testament. You know, he, he's talking about proclaiming the message that you find back here from Genesis through Malachi. Now, there is also an indication that he quotes Luke um, when he talks about scripture, at one point he does that, 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 18. So there's an indication that he might be familiar with at least some of the writings of the New Testament and considers them to be scripture, but we don't have the fullness of what we know of as the New Testament just yet. I think it's important to note that preaching the word here is not specific to preaching to non Christians. You know, whereas an evangelist, yes, is someone who focuses on bringing the word of Jesus, the message of Jesus, the good news of Jesus, to folks whose ears had not quite heard that yet, there is an obviously, there's a larger role than that. Because an evangelist preaches the word, it says being ready in season and out of season. 
literally timely and untimely. Or we might say, do it when it's convenient or when it's inconvenient. And remember, it was probably untimely or inconvenient preaching that put Paul into prison multiple times. Uh, in fact, he's going to speak about that, even in 2 Timothy, after this section. This could speak to uh, the evangelist perhaps preaching when it's convenient to preach, not necessarily when the message is convenient or not, but just when it's a good time to do it or when it's not such a good time to do it, because sometimes the timing is really bad <laughs> for somebody. You know, when there are situations that happen that come up doing the work of an evangelist uh, when it's just not a good time to do that kind of work. Now, I'm not complaining, and I hope that you understand that. Again, you know, I've said this before, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm, I am not trying to say right here, you know, that uh, I, I don't have the time to engage with people. I don't want anyone leaving here saying, well, Chris said that he doesn't have time to spend with me because that's not what I'm saying. Having said that, I don't have the time to spend with you uh, to some degree, right? You know, I'm really sorry about that sometimes, uh, especially over this last year or so when I've been really making a huge effort to finish a, a writing project that needs to be completed for a degree, um, which I am happy to say that that is just about over with. The writing portion is completed. Uh, the editing is you know, in place right now, and it's going to be turned in within the next couple weeks, finished, done, completed, graduations coming up, all that fun stuff. So I know that, that a lot of people have been asking me about it, and I know the elders have been saying, hey guys, don't forget, Chris has got this thesis he's working on, all that fun stuff. And so I've had a really good excuse built in for a while that I, you know, it, it's just going away now. So I will have some more time to devote and attend, you know, bring attention to various things. But here's, here's the reality. When you have a single evangelist that is with a group, there's a lot of stuff that people look to an evangelist to take care of, to deal with, to handle. And a lot of times that becomes more than what one person is able to take care of. And, and that's just been made worse over the last few years with COVID and everything else. Um, so just understand and realize that there are going to be times of convenience, times of inconvenience, but as Paul said, that's the work of an evangelist, right? To be ready when it's convenient, which is easy, but it's also to be ready when it's inconvenient, to get in there, to do the work, to help when it's necessary. It's kind of what I've signed up for. And for those who do the work of an evangelist, it is. It's what we've signed up for. <clears throat> So I hope you know I haven't checked out completely, but as this is just about over, I will have more time to devote to various things. And as part of the preaching, and part of the work of an evangelist, <clears throat> correction is an important aspect of that. That is correcting people, correcting things that need to be corrected. And so what Paul does here to Timothy is he tells him that in correcting people, there are three aspects that are important to remember. The first, he says, reprove. Now that's not a word that we use very often. Uh, so again, we're going to go back to the dictionary here and just kind of take a look at this. Uh, the idea of reproving is bringing something to light. That is exposing something that uh, has, has not been good. Now, <clears throat> when we talk about this idea of exposing, um, it's also convicting a person 
um, you know, c concerning something. You expose what was done. You convict the individual about what was done, that it was wrong, and you express a strong disapproval of someone's actions. All of these, these three different things, all of this is a part of the idea of reproving. And it's important for an evangelist to be able to, first of all, determine what is right, what is wrong, and to have the boldness to be able to say that was wrong and express a strong disapproval. Um, I don't have a problem seeing all of that involved, um, but I, I tend to think this idea of reproving is very important here. Paul is, is with this word beginning a three-step process of correction. There are three things that sometimes are looked at as disconnected. I think they are vitally connected. And so the first step is to convict a person concerning their sin, or that what they've done is wrong, showing a strong disapproval of what has been done. That's what reproving is. And sometimes an evangelist needs to be the one who steps in and who helps with the elders in a reproving scenario, especially, according to 1 Timothy chapter 5, if it's an elder who needs to be reproved. Because the elders are not above somebody watching them as well and being willing to step in as it's necessary. And so the evangelist starts his work with correction or re uh, reproving, but then it goes to rebuke. More word studies, right? Yay! Um, here you look at the idea, what, what does the word rebuke mean? It contains the idea of censure, um, expressing now strong disapproval of someone it's more than just reproof you know which, which again i took reproof means showing disapproval of someone's actions reproof is based on the actions that have been committed rebuke is actually focused on the individual who performed the actions it's not enough to say that was wrong to do you also need to say you were wrong to do it you might think it sounds like the same thing, but there is a subtle difference. You know, years ago, it, it, it wasn't uncommon in our house uh, for Sean or any of the older ones who had younger siblings to go running through the house in some way and barrel into someone else and knock them down, and then tears would start flowing and, and various problems, and then Julia or I would have to step in. And at this point, we would say, if it were Sean, we'd say, look, you need to be careful. You don't realize how much bigger you are than those other kids. You know, you could seriously hurt that little one the way that you just plowed into him. That is reproving the individual, but it was an accident. It, it, it was just something that happened. It wasn't a mental decision that was made. And so there was no rebuke necessary. Just a gentle reproof saying, hey, you know what, just be careful. That's a whole lot different than the times in which we might be sitting around and you hear a <laughs> followed by a Uh-oh, drop something here. Yeah, and, and then you go and you know what just happened there. That wasn't an accident. That was somebody who just hold off and hit the other one or shoved them or did any kind of stuff. Believe it or not, that happens in our house. I'm sure any of y'all who have had children understand this, right? Now, in that situation, we have to do the whole, that was a wrong thing to do, but because it was a purposeful action that was, you know, somebody thought it, and did it in order to cause direct harm, you then have to say to that individual, you were wrong for doing it. That action was bad, but you are also in the wrong for having thought of and doing that. It's a difference between uh, the two. Are you able to see kind of the difference I'm trying to get through here? Um, there's a difference between correcting someone's behavior that was a mistake as opposed to rebuking someone who has purposefully done something to hurt another. And so the next step would be to say, I'm disappointed 
in you and the decision-making ability. This was a bad action. This is a demonstration of a thinking process or sometimes lack thereof that needs to be corrected. Rebuking is showing displeasure not in what was done, but in the individual who did it. And letting that individual know <clears throat> that not only was it wrong that you did it, but you are in the wrong. And things need to happen in order to make amends. The sad part of this all is that sometimes it ends right there. Sometimes in discipline, when someone comes in, they reprove and they rebuke. And that's why I think a lot of people have problems with what's called hellfire and brimstone preaching. You know, that's a phrase that's not even hardly used at all. Some of y'all might remember hearing that phrase. Some of y'all older, older folks, you know, and, and people talking about it. Uh, some of y'all might even lament that we don't hear that. Well, the problem with the hellfire and brimstone preaching is that it was full of a lot of reproof and a lot of rebuke and a lot of judgment. In fact, there's even kind of a softened version of that. It's just people look at it as judgmental preaching or negative preaching, where it may not be hellfire and brimstone, but you're, you're being negative about certain things or certain actions. You're not just simply focusing on the positivity of love, and, and but, but you're actually talking about things that are wrong, things that need to be corrected. And people, there are a lot of people who don't like that. And I think part of the reason why a lot of people don't like that is because there's a whole lot of focus from the evangelist or the one that's doing it on repu reproving and rebuking, but then they stop right there. You know, when I make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, um, I put my peanut butter on one slice of bread, and then I put my jelly on the other slice of bread, which is the way that you're supposed to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. But you don't stop right there. There's a third part of it. You gotta slap those things together before you can actually eat your sandwich. There's a third part. And a lot of people don't see the fact that there's a third part to this exhort encourage to call to one's side to encourage the individual if all that you do is reprove and then rebuke but you don't add on the third part of this exhortation you're not going to get a good result out of this this is calling someone to your side i, I might reprove and then rebuke sean or any of the others you know it certainly wasn't just sean um, I could do that and walk away, and if that's all I've done, what have I done? I certainly haven't created a strong relationship. It's not complete until I call them to my side and give them a hug, or if nothing else, a good strong look in the eyes, to let them know our relationship is still intact. This hasn't severed anything. This hasn't caused a problem. You did something that was wrong. I need you to see it. I need you to know that you were wrong for doing it, but this is not the end of the relationship. Without um, exhortation, without encouragement, without calling them to your side and affirming the, the continued relationship, all you're doing is inviting those individuals to wander. Because in reproving and rebuking, it's easy to leave an individual simply discouraged, maybe even just terrified. If all you come in is discipline, tell them that they're wrong and leave. They'll feel lost and alone. They know that you disapprove of them. You've expressed that disapproval, but now what? See, the evangelist, and really, this is, I'm doing a lot of talk about the evangelist just because that's what Paul says. This is anybody who is in any position of authority, any position in which they have the authority to reprove and rebuke. And that goes for parents, bosses, uh, you know, just, just across the board, teachers, anyone who's in that position, reprove and rebuke needs to be followed up by exhortation and encouragement. I mean, this is how God does it. <laughs> And, and uh, we don't know 
how God expressed his disapproval of Cain. Remember in, in Genesis chapter 4? We only know that he had regards for Abel's sacrifice, but he didn't have regards for Cain. But, but look what he says to Cain. When Cain has been reproved and rebuked, God comes to him and he says, Look, Cain, why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? He says, yeah, maybe what you did wasn't exactly what I wanted, but let me tell you something, this isn't the end of the story. There are going to be more opportunities. I'm with you. I haven't left you. Our relationship, God is telling Cain, our relationship is still here. It's still intact. Let me encourage you to rise above this and to do better later. That's what God was trying to do for Cain. And that's just one example uh, that I use because it's an easy one to see God being this very person of exhortation after rebuke. But what you find as you read through the Bible, God does this thing over and over. Not only does he reprove and rebuke, but he then encourages those who have messed up. And he says that you are supposed to do this, Paul says, you're supposed to do this with great patience and instruction. How is Timothy supposed to reprove, rebuke, and then exhort? With patience and instruction. We all know those people, right, who are kind of quick to reprove, quick to rebuke. Um, my kids could probably tell you of someone they know who has been quick to reprove and to rebuke from time to time. You know, there's not a lot of things that I mentally think of and look back on and say, man, I really regret that. I try not to dwell on the negative of things, to focus on what's positive and build from it and move forward. But one thing that I find myself regretting is when there have been problems in the home, you know, when I'm looking at my responsibility to look after the kids, or if I'm just even around and, and I'm distracted doing something else, maybe working on a sermon or something else, and then I suddenly start hearing yelling, crying, you know, you hear that bang, you know, and the cry and all of that, you know, and, and, and I just walk in. I mean, I don't know if walk's the right thing. I just come barreling into the situation, and I stand there, and you got one person crying, another person with a terrified look on their face because they know what's coming. It's not hard to figure out what happened. One of them hit the other one, pushed them, shoved them, hurt them in some way. And so I would discipline the one who needed it, maybe even more harshly than necessary. And then after disciplining, I'd stop and ask questions. Only to find out it was an accident that happened. You know, no, didn't do it on purpose. Maybe the one who was crying had just hit the other one five or six times before you know, he finally just got tired of it and then hauled off and, and hit that individual or whatever the case. It's those moments I find out my handling of the situation was horribly done. What could have been different? I don't know. Maybe exercising self-control and patience? I don't know, maybe asking the questions before administering any kind of, of, of discipline yeah when you do that when patience is used when, when things remain calm it's amazing how often of these moments turn from terrible parenting moments to actually really good teachable moments a lot of times discipline becomes even unnecessary it doesn't have to get to the point of reproving and rebuking if you start with patience and instruction, because sometimes that handles the situation well enough. And at times where reproof and rebuke are necessary, they go so much better when I've been patient with the kids and I'm using the moment for instructional purposes. I think this is exactly what Paul is getting at. The evangelist's job is not to get in there and find what he can to reprove and rebuke. The evangelist's job is to instruct with patience and then when needed, reprove and rebuke should be done with exhortation. 
And I wish I, as well as every other person in place of authority anywhere, could remember this. In fact, let me repeat that. The evangelist's job is not to get into the situation and find reasons to reprove and rebuke, which is how it's often done. Look at things for what's wrong. Look at things for what's worthy of criticism. Look at things to find what's wrong with somebody or something. The evangelist's job, even in our culture of criticism that we live in, the evangelist's job is to instruct with patience. Will there be times where reprove and rebuke are necessary? With exhortation, absolutely. They might come up, but it's not the evangelist's job to look for them. It's to deal with them when they're necessary. All things should be grounded in patience and instruction. And so he goes on to say, this is skipping down to verse 5, be sober in all things. The idea here is, again, self-control. Uh, it's very much what we just talked about, having patience. Patience and instruction, reproof, rebuke, exhortation are not nearly as effective when an individual flies off the handle. This is why so many of Paul's attributes for being, uh, or at least looking at the things that will make an elder above reproach, they have to do with self-control. Is a man able to control himself? Self-control epitomizes what it means to be a leader of God's people. And if you have someone who can't control himself, he has no business trying to lead others. As an evangelist and really any leader, we must be sober in all things and be willing to endure hardship. You know, being part of, uh, part of being sober in all things is being willing to endure hardship. And another way to think of being willing to endure hardship, be willing to to be wronged. Be willing to be on the side of things that's short-changed. Be willing to be the person who comes up empty at somebody else, or at the expense for someone else. This is the way that Paul was, who was imprisoned and executed for the cause of Christ. This is the idea, endure hardship, be wrong. Allow yourself not to experience all the rights that you believe that you deserve for the sake of somebody else. And this, yeah, we, we don't have time to, to talk about all the places where you, know, you can find this idea of be willing to be wronged, but this is a predominant theme in so many sections of Scripture. It's all over the place. As a leader, as an evangelist, really a leader within the church, a leader in the church must put his own concerns on the back burner. He must bear the burdens of the ones that he serves. And how do we know how important this is? Because it was the great leader of the church, the head of the church, God incarnate, the eternal word who was with God and who was God and who became flesh and dwelt among us. It was God in the flesh who took a bowl and a towel and he washed the feet of the future leaders of his church. And after doing so, he said, now you go do the same. And then that God, as a man, went to his betrayal that same night and he went to the cross the next day, washing not feet, but washing the stain of sin for the whole world, for all those who would believe on him and come to him. That is what it means to be a leader. It's understanding that, that a leader must first and foremost work with the needs of those whom he leads. As Paul leaves Timothy in a place of leadership here in Ephesus, he charges him to be the leader that he is called to be. Do the work of an evangelist, and that includes enduring hardship. So as we look at this lesson, I, I guess it really wasn't exactly what we do here when we come together. I didn't talk about preaching sermons necessarily, but hopefully you can see the connection 
with the work of an evangelist. Next week, we're going to look into that very leadership, the teaching aspect of the church, by looking at a section from Ephesians, uh, and Paul's letter to the Ephesians. But, but this morning, as we conclude, I hope we can all see the value of the work of an evangelist. To not only teach those who've never heard the gospel message before, but to be involved in the teaching and the instruction as he preaches the word, as he corrects with reproof, rebuke, and exhortation, with patience and teaching, doing the work of an evangelist, fulfilling his ministry. Let's pray together. Our great and glorious almighty God, we humble ourselves before you, thanking you for your wisdom, for your providence, that you have not only given to us this church, you have helped us to understand how to lead effectively, demonstrating it through your son. We ask that you be with the leaders here. Help us in our teaching and in the correction that takes place here. And we ask this in the name of your son. Amen.